Welcome, everyone. My guest today is Managing Editor James Kleiman to talk about the president of NAR resigning over a blackmail threat, the latest in the commission lawsuits, and our lawsuit debate at the end of the month. James, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be back. Great to have you back. It feels like there is a lot of drama at the National Association of Realtors over the last year. Like, like they cannot catch a break. So maybe you could catch us up this week. What was the big news this week? So I feel like there are two trade organizations or advocacy organizations that have really had a lot of drama over the last year, and they all have the same letters. It's the NRA, Wayne LaPierre, right? that scandal, of course, and then the NAR, which has had its own series of scandals. We're not going to talk about gun rights today. Um, so let's talk about what's going on in Chicago at the NAR. So you may remember that even before the commission lawsuits really started to gear up, there was a big scandal at the NAR and the former president, the elect, I mean, basically elected, uh, is a guy named Kenny Parcell. And he's a realtor out of Utah, a very successful realtor. He's been a long-term advocate for NAR and the positions that they take. He's been, uh, a very popular member by most accounts for a long time. And he was accused in a New York Times expose of sexually harassing women and using his power to, I think, really prevent um, certain staffers, paid staffers at the NER from advancing. There were a lot of allegations. A couple days after the story broke, he ends up resigning. And the upcoming president, Tracy Casper, a, again, longtime realtor, strong advocate for a lot of the NER's positions. She's out of Utah. She is appointed the interim president. And then a couple months later in the fall, you know, formally she is appointed the actual president, right? She was only in the job for a couple months and we get this surprising email in our inbox from the NAR. And it essentially says that Tracy Casper is the victim of a blackmail attempt. And she decided instead of acceding to the request, the demand, I should say, she is not going to compromise her position at the NAR and she's going to resign. And so Tracy Casper was seen by a lot of people in the organization as a steadying figure. Um, obviously, she is a woman. She is someone who has been in the organization for quite some time. She has made a couple appearances talking about some of the pressures that the organization is facing and how members should be communicating with clients and with other agents and uh, in wake of the verdict in Sitzer Burnett in Missouri. And so it was very surprising to receive an email and it didn't really uh, detail much of the allegations, right? So we know that there was some blackmail attempt. We don't know what it was about. We don't know who made it. We don't know what they were requesting when the NAR says that she was asked to compromise her position as a leader at the organization. And we don't really know where this leaves the group. Um, so Kevin Sears has been um, pushed up, right? So he would probably be the NAR president next year based on the way the organization typically chooses uh, its leadership. And he's out of Massachusetts. He's been in kind of the higher ranks of the NAR for many years now. And he is known as a very professional guy. His dad has been in the real estate game for a very long time. He's been a broker owner in Massachusetts for decades and, um, you know, a very politically connected guy as well. So I, I think he's a really good choice. And it's yet another episode of turmoil, though. You don't want to see the president of your organization be out within just a couple months, right? And they're there to really fix some of the scandals that were uh, that occurred before they um, became president. So not, not a great look for the NAR. It's yet 
another black mark. And if you're a member, you have to be thinking, can't we just find somebody normal who isn't, this is not to excuse anyone who might be um, attempting to blackmail someone. Obviously that is reprehensible, it's inexcusable, but we can't find somebody at the organization who doesn't have something to be blackmailed over. You know, it's um, it, it's what a lot of people are thinking and, and it comes just after they have to pay their dues, right? So the timing is also not the best. The timing is not the best. And especially when you consider that the, you know, realtor profession is under a lot of duress right now. Not only is it, you know, low volume, and we've talked um, and written stories about, you know, the number of realtors actually making any money at all, much less a, a living wage is pretty low. And then you also have all these lawsuits who that are taking them to task for, you know, what is the value of a buyer's agent? What, why do we need uh, real estate agents in this age of Zillow? Which, you know, you and I would say there's, there's a lot to talk about there. That's not a foregone conclusion at all, but it's not a great time for them. And, and I'm sure that, you know, everyone was very disappointed in, in this particular turn of events because they just don't need it. They just don't need any bad publicity right now. Kudos to Tracy for, if someone was trying to, um, Tracy Casper, I don't know her personally, um, it, you know, if someone was trying to use uh, this information to pressure her on something with the NAR, I mean, you know, much better to resign in that in that case than someone who's like, you know, being under the influence of someone we don't know, but just uh, just rough for them. I, I just was at the uh, California Association of Realtors held a special event and, you know, just getting to talk to realtors, they're they're such community people. I mean, especially the people who are active in, in their state and local associations. And right. These are the professionals, though, Sarah. These are not the part-timers who are, you know, working as school teachers and maybe keep their license as a side hustle, right? These are the pros. These these are them. But, the, you know, aside from all of this drama, there's these really big questions they're asking. They, you know, especially in California, they want to know about uh, insurance and, and how do we fix the insurance problems so people can buy houses. They want to know about inventory and affordability and, like, all of this other stuff is really just like, you know, a lot of noise. Yeah. And I think there are real questions to be asked about the NAR's ability to fight the fights that the industry needs them right now to wage. You have Bob Goldberg left. I, I think a lot of people were disappointed in his performance as CEO. I haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, tears shed for Bob leaving, uh, which is not a knock on Bob, but in a lot of cases, it's just time, right? And, and they lost a very significant court case. There are 20 something copycat lawsuits that have been filed since he left practically. And, um, but so they don't have a CEO. They have a temporary CEO. How much power does she have to enact changes on a temporary basis? Um, and then you have really an interim on the member side who's there. We don't know the inner workings of, of that very bureaucratic, um, you know, segment of the organization, but it's not great for stability to have had three presidents in the span of six months. It's really not. Uh, it's really not. Well, let's talk about the commission lawsuits because those just continue to keep popping up. I think uh, we had a new one this week, right? Yeah, there are two new ones this week. One is in New York. I haven't read through it yet, so I, I can't speak to that one. Uh, but the second one is in Arizona. And I want to say this is the first time that Arizona has been, um, or that there has been a commission lawsuit filed in the state of Arizona. And, and this one is, again, they're all generally speaking pretty similar, right? It's because you want to model your claims after a case that has already set precedent, right? So they're going after the NAR's participation rule and they are naming a slew of brokerages, both national and local. So there's a ton of brokerages that I've never heard of that have been named to this lawsuit. And then there's kind of the usual brokerages that get into a lot of these lawsuits. Um, but what's really interesting about this one is that they don't name the NAR as a defendant. So maybe that's small relief for the NAR that they don't have to spend another, you know, $150,000 or whatever it might cost to defend themselves against yet another lawsuit. Um, and, and given that the NAR is not really much of a power in the state of New York, they probably dodge that one too, I would have to think. But Again, I haven't read that one, so I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, I, I mean, again, it's it's really a lot of the same claims. And what's interesting to date to me is that we're not seeing lawsuits that name the agents individually for the most part. They're naming associations 
in a couple select cases, they're naming MLSs, um, which are generally run by these realtor affiliated associations and they're naming the brokerages, no surprise there. But the ones who have all the money, when you look at how business actually works in real estate and residential real estate, is the agents are making 80% of the money. Everyone else is just getting little crumbs. They're getting a lot of crumbs because there are so many agents and they're paying dues and fees, et cetera. But the vast majority of the money is going to the agents themselves. And it surprises me on some level that we haven't seen like, just by way of example, like Kevin Sears, the new president of the NAR, he is a realtor. He hasn't been named in any lawsuits in Massachusetts. Tracy Casper, an Idaho realtor, who was the president of the NAR, hasn't been named to any of these lawsuits. And if you're making an attempt to say that there is a conspiracy here, I think it's a lot stronger a case to say there is a link between these people who are running this organization that has de facto set the rules that everyone must follow and does follow if they want access to MLSs in most states or many states. Um, so that, that part surprises me, and, and I'm not trying to give anybody ideas here. I don't know if there's there's probably a good legal reason um, that you know top agents that are active in the NRA haven't been named, or really agents in general haven't been named. There was a case in Texas um, filed by a guy who ran a mortgage publication of all things, uh, which which is pretty interesting. Um, and that one does name some agents, but yeah, it's it's just interesting to me that they're not really going after the money. I mean, even the NAR, which does have theoretically, uh, you know, a billion dollars, maybe more, um, they don't have the kind of money that agents collectively have. Um, and there's probably a good legal reason for it, uh, but it just surprises me because lawyers are kind of they're like bloodhounds, you know, they they follow the scent, and the scent is money. The scent is money, but from my perspective, it's like, you know, if you're, I mean, think about the job of taking on all these individual agents and, and there's only certain ones now, I mean, you could narrow it down because there's only certain ones who make money. But to me, it's like proving a conspiracy at that level would be much harder, I think, than, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, here's these organizations. And I, I still didn't feel like, um, you know, they proved a conspiracy at, at the high level, much less on that individual level. So, um, and, no. you know. And, and I've been very consistent in saying, I don't think that there is a proper conspiracy. I think that the jury was swayed by other factors and and maybe there is a lot of causality, right? There's definitely a lot of incentives from all parties to keep commissions high. That should come as no surprise. That doesn't mean that they all banded together or have even loosely determined that there is a system in place whereby which, you know, the goal is to inflate commissions. Um, I think the goal has just been everybody wants to get a piece of the pie and this is the best way to do business because it provides seller benefits and insurances for the buyer. And it's been a pretty successful system. I think you have to say, although I imagine Michael Ketchmark would disagree with me and, and he'll have his opportunity to, to say a little bit more about that in a couple of weeks. He will. So um, just to let everyone know, um, we, we do have a debate coming up on January 26th at 1 Central. Um, we're going to do um, a virtual debate on, in a webinar format um, between Michael Ketchmark, who is the plaintiff's attorney and sister Burnett, and Anthony Lamacchia, who has not been named in any of the suits, but is a pretty outspoken uh, realtor voice. Um, he, he does a lot of videos. He does a lot of social. And um, he's he's wanted to... Uh, really, really weigh in on this case and and feels like, you know, this would be a great um, format. So we've set it up so that uh, it's not going to be a shouting match, but it is going to be a substantive debate on some of the issues. And and what that looks like is that there were a lot of things raised in the trial, especially about, um, uh, you know, the value of a, a buyer broker, the uh, relative merits of, of, you know, the whole way the process works that especially Anthony felt like hadn't been really addressed and there were some mischaracterizations. He really wanted to ask Ketchmark and challenge Ketchmark on specifically. And Ketchmark was game, you know, I mean, this is what he does. He's a trial lawyer. He's a very successful one, obviously. Um, he has no fear of this. He's like, let's do it, bring it. Um, so we're excited um, because we think this could be valuable for the audience. It's not, like I said, I'm, I'm moderating. Not It's not going to be a, a slugfest, but I do think it will give 
you know, especially realtors and people in the uh, profession, some, you know, some, some more insight, or at least have their voices heard, because I do think that, you know, there was some feeling that like, you know, there were some mischaracterizations about the whole process that it didn't seem like were challenged, you know, to, to an extent that many people wanted to. So this will be um, a, a way to kind of see what that looks like. It might also give us some insight into the strategy Catchmark is going to go with in the future. It might not, um, but we think that it's an important discussion and we've gotten a huge response, thousands of people signing up and we haven't hardly even done any promo. So um, people can go to housingware.com and look under our events and, and they can sign up for that. Uh, it's free, obviously. Um, so I, I would say, you know, people want to do that, but I, I feel like there's things unfolding in this case every single day. I mean, we, the NAR actually um, petitioned, right? Like they're asking for a, yeah, they're basically asking for a new trial. They're asking for a new trial. So what, what is that about? What, what basis are they, are they asking for there? They're saying that the judge erred in allowing certain evidence and didn't enter other evidence that should have been entered. This is pretty standard fare when uh, it comes to civil cases of this nature. So they had a deadline to hit, as did Home Services of America, as did Keller Williams. And, and so the filings really have only started trickling in in the last couple of days. And, um, you know, it, it will be some time before we have uh, a little bit more clarity over what happens next. Uh, but there are definitely other commission lawsuit happenings and, and related cases that we're keeping an eye on. There's going to be some movement in the no select case in the next couple of weeks. We're probably going to get some sort of an answer regarding the Department of Justice and their attempts to reopen I I investigations into NAR. Um, I think we'll probably see some movement there again in the next couple of weeks to months. And then we'll almost certainly get a decision regarding injunctive relief in the spring for Sitzer Burnett. And so that will be the major, major case uh, development to follow. So we're, we're probably not going to have a whole lot uh, in the interim in, in terms of, you know, major, major, major changes. Um, but it, it's going to be, I think, a pretty interesting pitter patter over the next couple months. And I also think, by the way, I know that you're trying to do a debate, uh, a civil debate using modern technology, presumably Zoom or, or something similar, so that people aren't shouting over one another. I think you should give the people what they want and do a celebrity boxing match and just let them between between rounds, you know, articulate their their position and and shout back and forth. But then really, you know, let them let them put the gloves on. That's that's what I think. You know, you you want like real entertainment value. That's that's where to do it. You know, I I think you're right. I do think that that's what people want. I actually think that's what both participants want. They're both like these these guys are ready to go. They're ready to fight for what they think is right in their position and um no fear in either one of them. So yeah, my, my job as a moderator is to make sure that we get some substantive uh, talking out of this, not just uh, over talking and they both said they would. And I think they have some interesting things to say, but yeah, I think uh, if we could do the paper TV uh, model, I would, I would do it. But, and I think they would sign up for it. I think that there might even be some sort of like WWE style uh, dramatics, you know, like I, I would have entrance music, right? I would also have some sort of a plot line where Lamakia gets sued by Catchmark in the state of Missouri, you know, and and he has to travel in every couple of weeks to do depositions. I, I think you could really make it make it a spectacle. But, uh, it can but, but in all seriousness, I, I think this will be really informative. And that there are a lot of le legitimately debatable points about the value of an agent. I mean, you, you look at any Instagram thread, you look at Reddit and just the, the general populace and you hear what they think about the value that their buy side agent has provided. And it is very mixed. Um, you know, we, we know from surveys that a lot of consumers believe that they got good value, but they don't necessarily believe that other consumers got good value from it. So I, I think that there's a lot of um, really interesting nuance here and I, I hope that they can explore it. And, and I know you all want it to be really civil. That's not my thing. You know, I, I really just want absolute chaos and sort of, if, if you're familiar with the phrase um, order Muppets and chaos Muppets, I am a chaos Muppet. And so I, I want to see some drama. So anyway, I hope everyone will tune in. I think it'll be a good watch. It will be a good watch. And um, thanks, James, for getting on. And, you know, your newsroom's great, doing a great job covering all the different angles of this very complicated story that just keeps playing out. Um, 
uh, as we go. So we'll keep an eye out for that. And thanks for being on today. Cool. Thanks, Sarah.